Russia is the largest commercial nuclear energy player in the world, and it's not even close. By every major metric, number of new projects, exports, market share, the Russian nuclear company Rosatom dominates the global industry. For all of the talk and attention about new nuclear projects in the US or the UK, or even seemingly major announcements like Poland, they pale in comparison to the scale of Rosatom. And perhaps even more remarkably, the company has been able to become the largest in almost no time. Having only been founded in 2007, YouTube is older than that. The scale of Rosatom's reach is almost unbelievable. 40% of all new build projects are by Rosatom, and 75% of all foreign projects. Within Russia, there are only four plants under construction, but internationally, things are much more active. Places like Belarus, Bangladesh, Turkey, Slovakia, Iran, India, China, Egypt, and Hungary all recently completed or have reactors under construction by Rosatom. The entire United States only has the two units coming online at the Vogel plant, and the UK only has two under construction. France, which is heavily dependent on nuclear power, has just one. And it's not just new plants. Rosatom dominates the nuclear fuel market, a complex and multi-step process to keep existing reactors running. Through its subsidiary 10X, Rosatom controls almost 50% of the world's uranium enrichment capacity, meaning they have extraordinary influence on the market. Even the US imports 14% of its uranium from Russia. The war in Ukraine has slowed, but certainly not stopped Rosatom's progress. How does one company manage to have such a tight grip on the global nuclear industry? So much so that it dwarfs even state-owned rivals in France and China. Well, it comes down to three main things. Business strategy, politics, and money. So let's dive in and see how Russia manages to stay on top. Russia itself has a deep history of working with nuclear energy. In 1954, the Obninsk nuclear power plant in the Soviet Union became the world's first nuclear reactor to generate electricity for a grid, producing around 5 megawatts of electrical power. Over the next decades, around 50 reactors would be built within Russia, and another 30 or so in the Soviet republics of Eastern Europe. During that time, the technical skills and engineering know-how to build nuclear plants became well established. What emerged after the fall of the Soviet Union in the early 1990s was a broad group of capable scientists and an industry that just needed some structure. Recognizing this potential, Putin reorganized the country's many companies and government agencies together, which led to the establishment of Rosatom in 2007, with the goal of transforming the fragmented and localized Russian nuclear industry into a global leader, with a particular focus on expanding beyond its traditional home market. And boy, did it succeed. We talk about Rosatom as though it were one company, but it is actually made up of about 350 subsidiary companies. These include all aspects of the nuclear supply chain from start to finish. Mining, engineering and construction, power production and operations, components, fuel, research and development, spent fuel, waste and decommissioning. And these are just the core nuclear energy businesses. That doesn't even include all of the other things that Rosatom is involved with, like nuclear medicine and isotope production for hospitals, nuclear-powered icebreakers for clearing shipping lanes, process control systems for computer chips, infrastructure for city water purification and distribution systems, and yes, even wind power and energy storage. Very few companies can even come close to attempting to manage the scope and scale of Rosatom. One thing you'll notice about the way the company is structured is that the full life cycle and supply chain of the nuclear plant is contained within Rosatom. It's this vertical integration that gives the company its first main advantage over most of its competitors. Let me give you an example. Let's say you are in charge of a small country and you want to build your first nuclear power plant. Good for you. You've narrowed your choice down to two designs from two companies, Company A and Rosatom. Now you're going to need a few things to make sure your plant is successfully built and actually operates. You'll need someone to design the reactor itself. Both Company A and Rosatom do this. So far, so good but you'll also need someone to design and build all the supporting equipment, structures, piping, and electrical systems like the turbine generator. Company A doesn't do that, so you'll need to go out into the market and sign contracts with other companies to get those parts in place. Rosatom does it in-house as part of their engineering division. You'll also need uranium fuel to power the reactor. Company A doesn't offer that, so again, you'll need to go out to the market. Rosatom does. You'll need to train maintenance crews and operators. Rosatom. Support during operation. Rosatom. Spent fuel and waste management. Rosatom. Eventual decommissioning. Rosatom. It's like if you're going to buy a car, but the only thing Company A will sell you is the engine. You'll have to go get the wheels, the doors, the electronics, and all the other parts from somewhere else. Make sure they work with Company A's engine, and then get someone else to put it all together. 
With Rosatom, you get the whole car in one purchase. You can start to see what makes the company so attractive. Rosatom is offering the full life cycle and every component you'll need to build and operate the plant. While a lot of the other guys are forcing you to go out and bid and manage probably a dozen other contracts because they don't offer those services. This can be especially difficult for newcomers who may be building a nuclear plant for the first time. They won't know the details of the market. What's a good maintenance company? Will they be able to work on this specific design? Where am I going to get uranium? What are the international import and export laws that I need to follow? There are a thousand questions like this, and the Russians offer one simple and consistent answer, Rosatom, a company that has demonstrated it has the resources and experience to make it happen. Rosatom offers a variety of power outputs in its reactors, which gives flexibility to customers to select a design matching their needs. Still, these reactors don't really offer any significant technical advantage over other designs, and in many cases may actually be behind. But the integrated offer provided by Rosatom more than makes up for any of these design shortcomings. However, the design and construction of the plant doesn't matter so much if it can't be built. And the other big part to make that happen is, how is the plant going to be paid for? What is the financial mechanism that's going to be used to build this thing? This is Russia's second big advantage. Rosatom offers not just vertical integration of engineering, construction, fuel and operations, but financing for the project as well. That means, essentially, Rosatom will come in, build the plant, operate it, fuel it, maintain it, and provide the money to pay for it all. Now to understand why they would do this, let's look at an example. Rosatom is currently building four large reactors at the Eldaba plant in Egypt, where they will be the country's first nuclear power plants. Lacking or unwilling to provide the money to build the new reactors, Russia is financing 85% of the project through a $25 billion state loan with a very attractive repayment plan at 3% interest over the next 22 years. In return, Egypt will buy maintenance, support, and perhaps most importantly, nuclear fuel from Rosatom for the 60-year lifetime of the plant. This locks Egypt into Rosatom and Russian supply technology and fuel indefinitely. While that may or may not be politically the choice that every country would make, for Egypt it is much better than any offer they would have received from anywhere else. Realistically, only large state-backed companies like Rosatom can make this type of offer, and so that's who they go with. The next closest would be the state-owned French companies like EDF and Framatom. In a similar but more contentious example, EDF is financing the construction of two reactors in the UK at Hinkley Point C through a combination of its own contributions and support from two Chinese nuclear companies. At an estimated cost of 33 billion pounds, EDF had to raise about 4 billion euros of its own capital, mostly from the French government, and further loan guarantees from the British government. All of this was contingent on EDF being able to sell the future electricity at a certain price, which involved extensive and controversial negotiations with the British government. In the end, this strike price ended up being about double that of the typical market rates for electricity in the UK, a cost that will be passed on to consumers. And herein lies the biggest key to Rosatom's success. Prospective customers don't need to deal with all of these issues. Rosatom comes in and is willing to finance projects with very attractive terms that are simply not available elsewhere. It's difficult to underscore just how important this is. Availability of financing makes or breaks these types of large infrastructure projects. And it's something Rosatom's competitors, especially private companies, just can't compete with. No private company is going to offer loans for tens of billions of dollars over two decades below market interest rates across multiple projects. Not only do they not have that kind of cash lying around, but the risk and payback periods are simply too long. Without access to easy financing with attractive terms, none of these projects would likely exist. The state backing of the Russian government enables Rosatom to enter into projects that are simply unfeasible or just too risky for its competitors to take on. There is perhaps no better example of this than the Rapport plant under construction in Bangladesh. While Bangladesh is the second largest economy in South Asia after India, it is still a developing economy. And with that, there are many risks, both commercial and financial, that make such a project less attractive to many established companies. Not the least of which are factors such as the skill of the local labor, government policy, and currency fluctuations. Nonetheless, Rosatom is building two reactors there at a cost of around $13 billion, of which 90% is financed by a loan from the Russian government. These will be Bangladesh's first nuclear power plants. Construction started in 2017, with the first reactor coming online in 2024, and the second a year after that. Work is progressing more or less on schedule and budget at the site something that has been an ongoing challenge for many Western nuclear companies. Rosatom's vertical supply chain and extensive experience in building in a variety of international markets gives them a comparatively good overall track record in building and starting up new plants. 
Countries entering nuclear for the first time will also need to navigate a very complex set of international agreements and treaties, most of which are designed to monitor and limit the use of nuclear technology to prevent it from being used for other, less peaceful purposes. There are some relatively standard treaties that countries agree to, such as the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and the reporting requirements that fall under the International Atomic Energy Agency, or IEA. These agreements do things like allow inspectors and cameras in nuclear facilities, and require accounting of special nuclear material, like uranium. However, if a country wishes to engage with a U.S. nuclear company, they must enter into a direct agreement with the U.S. government, with what's known as a 123 agreement, referring to the specific section of the Atomic Energy Act, which was a law passed by the U.S. Congress in 1954. This law governs how nuclear materials and technology of U.S. origin must be managed by the other country, and must be agreed to by the other country before it can receive any nuclear technology of U.S. origin. This includes large things like reactor design and nuclear instrumentation, to small things like the metal tubes used in nuclear fuel. The 123 Agreement also stipulates that any technology or design that is derived from U.S. information must also fall under the same agreement. This means that any design that even used a piece of U.S.-based nuclear technology also requires the country to sign a 123 Agreement, even if the U.S. is not involved in the project. An example of this is the Korean APR-1400 design, which the Koreans have been actively promoting to bid in several international projects. It also uses several elements of US-based nuclear technology. If Korea wishes to enter a new market with this reactor, such as Bangladesh, the Bangladeshi government will need to enter into negotiations with the US and sign a 123 agreement before Korea could sell and start construction of the reactor, something the Bangladeshi government may or may not be interested in doing. But what's the big deal? Countries sign treaties all the time, in fact, 47 countries around the world have already entered into 123 agreements. Well, not every country may find the terms acceptable just to have access to US-based nuclear technology. 123 agreements give the US government a fair amount of influence over the foreign country's nuclear program and is negotiated with each individual country. For example, the United Arab Emirates entered into its 123 agreement with the US in 2009, and in order to have access to US nuclear reactor technology, gave up its option to produce enriched uranium meaning the country would rely entirely on the international market for supply of uranium for its reactors. If you imagine the situation in reverse, where a US company wanted to build a nuclear reactor but needed the US federal government to agree to certain conditions in a treaty with Bangladesh, I can fairly speculate that there would be a bit of outrage. And the utility might seek other suppliers just to escape the whole issue. With Russia, countries can entirely avoid these kinds of legal requirements. In the case of Bangladesh, its government was not forced to enter into an additional agreement with the United States in order to build its own reactor, leaving them more in control of their project and nuclear policy. Now, after the reactor is built, plants need regular shipments of uranium in order to keep operating. And this is where Russia has its tightest grip, not only on its own plants, but many in the West as well. Through its uranium subsidiary company, Tenex, Rosatom controls 38% of the world's uranium conversion and 46% of the uranium enrichment capacity. These are two essential steps in the process of creating usable nuclear fuel. Since Russia occupies such a large portion of the market, it is nearly impossible to avoid using them for at least some portion of the nuclear fuel supply chain. Sensing this dependency risk, the US government began to limit the amount of uranium that US nuclear plants could use from Russian suppliers in 2020. But prior to that restriction, Rosatom was supplying one-fifth of the uranium to US reactors. Russia's integrated uranium network and economies of scale make it difficult for other companies to compete on price. The U.S. currently only has one enrichment facility with the capacity to serve only about one-third of the U.S. nuclear reactor fleet's needs, which means the rest needs to be imported from abroad. Rosatom also offers a unique service in that it will take back spent nuclear fuel. Uranium fuel in Russian reactors is typically used over a five-year period, after which it is stored on site for another five years to allow the radioactivity to decrease. Rosatom will then arrange to ship the spent nuclear fuel back to Russia, where it can be reprocessed and reused. This provides a bit of a win-win, especially for countries with small nuclear programs or without a clear policy on what to do with high-level nuclear waste. Something that other companies are very reluctant to do, and something that is legally impossible in the US. All of these features and significant vertical integration means Rosatom is by far the largest nuclear company in the world in 2021 generating about $8.5 billion in revenue from international projects. Other large nuclear companies such as Framatom and Westinghouse operate on revenues of less than half that, although neither offers the complete integrated approach that Rosatom does, so direct comparisons are difficult. Rosatom's march towards an ever-increasing control of the market appeared inevitable until February 2022, when through no fault of Rosatom itself, 
Russia launched its invasion and occupation of Ukraine. The move soured many utilities' relations with Rosatom, particularly in Europe, where it exposed the large dependency of several states on the Russian company for fuel, technology, and parts. In response, several European countries have started to step away from Rosatom, even though that means giving up many of its advantages. The Czech Republic's energy company, Chez, has signed contracts with Westinghouse and Framatone to supply nuclear fuel. In Finland, the energy company Fenoema terminated its troubled contract with Rosatom to build a new reactor, and another company has hired Westinghouse to begin supplying fuel to its twin Russian-designed reactors. These are moves aimed at diversifying the supply chain, as shifting politics could see plants losing access to Russian fuel. And with few alternatives immediately available, this could cause significant disruptions to nations' electrical pricing and stability. Bulgaria signed a new 10-year agreement with Westinghouse to supply fuel to its existing reactors, and has signed a preliminary agreement with the American company to build new reactors. Poland has already signed with Westinghouse to construct its first nuclear plant with up to three new reactors. Others in Slovakia, Hungary, and obviously Ukraine, have all moved away from Rosatom for nuclear fuel and services. Bids for new reactor construction have also been restricted, with projects specifically excluding Rosatom for new reactors in the Czech Republic, Poland, and Bulgaria. But outside of Europe, support for Rosatom hasn't really been affected. Construction of new reactors continues in China, India, Iran, and elsewhere. Even in Turkey, a member of NATO, construction on a four-unit plant is continuing and nearing completion. While the war in Ukraine may undermine Rosatom's position and reputation in Europe, its global standing appears to remain strong. It's hard to beat what is being offered. A fully integrated plant, designed, built, and fueled by one company, without lingering political commitments and easy financing to make it happen. It's almost impossible for private Western companies to compete with large state-backed companies like Rosatom. And without significant policy or technological improvements, it's unlikely that will change anytime soon. So what do you think? Will Rosatom continue to lead the rest of the nuclear industry? Or will new designs and technology shift the balance of power? Let me know down in the comments below. And thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.